Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, Catherine, come sit down. Okay? The Queen's Chair. Right. Um, my name is Bushra Batayne. I'm the um, current co-vice president of the UN Association. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming, especially our advisory board members. And I'd like to thank Catherine Deshawn for inviting us to her beautiful home. Um, uh, allow me to introduce our distinguished um, guest tonight, uh, Professor Richard Falk. He is um, the Albert Milbank Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University and visiting distinguished professor at the Global and International Studies Department at UC Santa Barbara. Um, his most recent book, The Great Terror War, considers the American response to September 11th and um, he was appointed by the United Nations to serve on a three-person Human Rights Inquiry Commission for the Palestinian Territory and um, the author of numerous other books as well. Um, he serves as chair of the board of directors for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation and as honorary um, vice president of the American Society of International Law. So without further ado, I start. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, nice words, and thank you all for coming on a beautiful Saturday evening. Of course, you're rewarded by the delicious food and the lovely setting, so it isn't a complete sacrifice. The only sacrificial part is having to listen to me. That's oh, God! <laughs> Our pleasure. But, uh, when uh, Nico asked me to speak, he suggested that I talk about legitimacy in wars, which is a sort of favorite topic of mine, and he must have a little bit of special uh, intuitive foresight, because of course this yeah. incident this week uh, with the attack on so-called freedom fl flotilla that was taking humanitarian uh, supplies to the Gaza Strip is a uh, very dramatic instance of what I have been thinking about in relation to this phenomenon of le legitimacy wars. Let me explain a little bit what I uh, mean by it. it. It's what I call the uh, second war that, the, that when we think mainly of an encounter between military capabilities, a hard power uh, uh, exchange between uh, sovereign states as the sort of primary uh, understanding of the nature of war and the realist assumptions about conflict and war is that the side which has hard power advantages usually wins. That there's a, uh, that that's, uh, and most governments, including our own, maybe particularly our own, are guided, independent of who, which party is in power, by hard power realists. That is, they believe that the main agency of history and of historical change is by successful deployment of hard power in conflict <coughs> situations or to address hostile uh, adversaries. Really? Uh, and my uh, sense increasingly has been that there's, a f there's some fundamental misconceptions that embedded in that hard power realist understanding of conflict and history. And uh, I guess my own uh, thinking about this was shaped a great deal by the Vietnam War, where uh, total uh, military superiority on the American side as an intervening foreign power in a formerly colonial uh, country uh, fail to succeed. That, that, uh, you win every battle, but you lose the war. <laughs> See, and, and the question that I've put to myself for a long time 
is why couldn't we learn why couldn't we learn from that experience? Right. Mm -hmm. What is what is defective about our uh, the, the the learning curve of our leadership? Uh, that it continues to be um, it continues whatever the experience it continues to have this uh, uh, commitment to hard power realism and uh, we see the same dynamic having played out in Iraq where there was complete failure to appreciate the difference between where hard power works which is either defensively or on a military battlefield but where it doesn't work is when you try to engage in foreign intervention to restructure a, a society according to your own political goals in other words foreign intervention in the non-western world since the end of world war ii has consistently failed and yet uh, that failure hasn't registered mm -hmm. and we continuously try to reinvent uh, doctrines that will somehow disguise the failure and find a new framework within which to repeat the error and, and I believe that's what's happening to some extent in uh, uh, Afghanistan at the moment uh, and each time we try to uh, pretend that the real essence of, the, of our intervention is for is to benefit the society that is the target of that intervention in the Vietnam context uh, the, the conversation became one of winning the hearts and minds but that was the essence of the war. It wasn't about uh, winning the battles on the battlefield. And now we have a, uh, a military leadership, uh, including uh, generals that are primarily known for their counterinsurgency specialization, who <laughs> emphasize the civilian side of they are protecting civilians even though drones are killing them See, and, that, and that that contradiction uh, is never resolved uh, it cannot be resolved in my view so that the first part of this interest in what I'm calling legitimacy wars comes from a, a critique of hard power realism criticism of that as a guide to policy which it is. See, uh, part of what I'm suggesting is that it's a guide to policy. And the second aspect is the more I looked around at the conflict since the end of World War II, since the end of 1945, they've rarely been, uh, rarely the side with military superiority has prevailed in the war. All of the anti colonial wars were won by the weaker side militarily. <coughs> and uh, some of the victories were spectacular in this regard. Gandhi, uh, Gandhi's leap, uh, <coughs> challenge to the uh, British Empire was uh, based, uh, as you all of you know, on principled nonviolence. But not on, not on, uh, not uh, renouncing coercion. It, uh, his, uh, brilliant tactics were extremely successful in mobilizing nonviolent coercive resistance to the British Empire and the so that what seems to be a, a historical development and, and it's necessary to try to understand why this has happened because it hasn't always been the case in the 19th century, uh, foreign intervention uh, was very economical and successful and rewarding often to the intervening power. 